بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما تعلمنا وزدنا من فضلك علم وتعليما إنك على كل شيء قدير وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه السلام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So الحمد لله we are here uh, at lesson number 11 of Imam Bajuri's commentary on Imam Tirmidhi's Shamail al muhammadiyya And we're going to speak today a little bit about the armor of the Prophet ﷺ and talk about his turban, his waist cloth, and then getting into the different physical postures of the Prophet ﷺ. So the next hadith, and we narrate with our ima, uh, with, uh, through our teacher back to um, the chain uh, of Imam Tirmidhi, back to the Prophet ﷺ. بَابُ مَا جَاءَ فِي صِفَةِ دِرْعِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ قَالَ حَدَثَنَا أَبُو سَعِيد So, sorry, the first thing we're going to read about is uh, the, sorry, the description of the armor of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه So it's not, shouldn't say sword, it should actually say armor. Uh, and it goes, قَالَ حَدَثَنَا أَبُو سَعِيد عَبْدُ اللَّهِ بِنْ سَعِيد الأشج حدثنا يونس ابن بكير عن محمد بن اسحاق عن يحيى ابن عباد ابن عبد الله ابن الزبير عن ابيه عن جده عبد الله ابن الزبير عن عن الزبير ابن العوام قال كان علي كان كان على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يوم احد درعان فنهض الى الصخرة فلم يستطع فاقعد طرحته تحته وصعد النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم حتى استوى على الصخرة قال سمعت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول اوجب طلحة يرحمك الله Zubair ibn al-Awwam said, the Prophet ﷺ wore two coats of chainmail armor on the day of Uhud. So he tried to climb up on top of a boulder, but was not able to. And he then had Talha stoop down beneath him. And the Prophet ﷺ climbed up and until he stood upright on the rock. And the Prophet ﷺ then he said, the narrator said, I heard the Prophet ﷺ say, Talha has secured it. Talha has secured it. Aujaba Talha. Okay, what does that mean? So let's go back first. When, when we're talking about the chapter, Imam Bajuri is talking about the, uh, uh, the armor of the Prophet ﷺ, Dira. Armor in those days was not, it was, it was what they called chain mail. Do you guys know what chain mail is? It's not the plates of armor like you see in the knights of like, you know, European knights, but it's little, little rings of metal that have been fashioned, fashioned out of steel and they're linked together to form a shirt. And that metal, when it's linked together, it can, you know, do things like stop a sword from striking it and it's a type of protection. Obviously, when all those little, little links of armor of, of, of steel get combined, that shirt is a very heavy shirt to wear, right? And now imagine wearing two of those things. So when you wear two, now, uh, so subhanAllah, this chapter is describing how the Prophet ﷺ wore that, right? And it is, a, it is this, iron, this iron shirt, literally, right? Made from link to link that is worn during war. That's called the dira. And the Prophet ﷺ, uh, had different uh, suits of armor and he would have different names for them. So, so one of them was called that al-fudul because it was very, very long, Right? And uh, he's the, th- this is the armor, actually. The, that, that al-fudul, this very long chainmail armor, is the one that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he had passed away, he had given this armor in, uh, as a security to uh, Abu Shaham, a Jewish man, uh, in exchange for grain for his family. So this is that armor. Because the, 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 you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he used to buy grain, if he didn't have the money to pay immediately for his own family. Swan, listen to this. The Rasul Sallallahu When he used to buy food for his family, you know, to buy on credit, um, this person would say, you know, it's a very silly thing, but non-Muslim, you know, how do I know that you'll pay? And so the Prophet Sallallahu said, here, take my armor, and it's as a, a collateral, right? And so he gave it to him. And so when you pay, then you get back your armor. And so they would hold on to that as a way of knowing that, hey, are you going to pay or not? And when the Prophet ﷺ left this earthly abode, then that armor was still with that man at the time. And there's also another chainmail armor called that al wishah and another one called that al hawashi another one called Fidda, silver, another one called uh, as-Sughdiyya, 
and another one called, and they say that this was also uh, the chain mail belonging to Dawood alayhi salam that he wore when he killed Goliath. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And then there's one called Al-Batra. And another one called uh, Khirniq. Never heard of that word. Khirniq. So th- there are different names. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what does it tell us? As we said before, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had some possessions. You know, they had about, how many is that? Six or seven suits of armor. Because that's what you needed in, the, in those times. He wasn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't a collector. It was something you needed at the time. And he might have been gifted. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam named his things because he cared for his things. And you know, every time I tell myself, you know what, I'm going to name my stuff too, you know. So it's not bad if you want to follow a sunnah, right? Go home and like name three of your things. Okay, just name your phone. Phone, phone, phone. Just name just name your phone. Let's do, let's do that, okay? So I'm going to try to remember that. I'm going to call mine. Okay, I'll tell you what I'll call mine later. <laughs> and, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come back to exchange names. So this is the, the, this, the first hadith is talking about the day of Uhud in which the Prophet ﷺ tried to, why did he try to climb onto a boulder? In, on the day of Uhud, the Muslims, when they, were, uh, when they were scared by the sudden attack of the Quraysh and the tide turned, the Muslims started to run. Now, the people thought that the Prophet ﷺ had been killed and he was injured in his face. And so he perhaps wanted to get up onto a boulder in order to let people know that he was still, uh, you know, he was still here. And he was okay, right? So let me read. Let's let's read a little bit into the commentary of Imam Bajuri. He says uh, that the Prophet ﷺ went to a boulder to climb up so that the Muslims could see him, so they could know the Prophet ﷺ is still alive. And so you know, uh, so then, and so that they can come back. And they were fleeing from the war. Let let him come back. Now, because the boulder was very high. He couldn't pull himself up because if you're trying to pull yourself up normally, it's fine. But if you're wearing one suit of armor, then two, you know, it's like carrying like maybe a hundred pounds on your back. You know, if you have a hundred pound backpack to pull yourself up is, is very difficult, right? Or even more perhaps. And the Prophet was very strong though. And the other thing is that he also had a gash in his head, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and his, his uh, blessed forehead was gashed as well. So he was injured as well. And there was a lot of uh, blood that he was losing, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it was also because of that he was injured. Otherwise, he was very, very strong. And when he got up, then Talha, what he did was, uh, Talha basically became a human ladder. So you know when you boost somebody, you get down, you let them get on your shoulders and then you boost them up. Talha sat, kneeled down, let the Prophet get on on his back and raised him up. So the Prophet then was able to put his blessed foot on uh, Talha's back and then get up on top of the uh, the rock until he was able to become stable and get up and tell the Muslims that he's there. And this is where the Prophet told Talha, Ojib oh, Talha. It means Talha has made it wajib. What has Talha made wajib? What has, it means he, he has secured it. He's gotten it. You got it. What, what has he gotten? What did, what, what did Talha? That's right. Alhamdulillah, that's good. He did something. He said, Talha has done something that has sealed and guaranteed his place in paradise. Right? And th- the thing is that this was done when as Talha was lifting him, because to lift a, hum- a, a person while they're wearing two chains of armor would be like carrying a human being on your back while they're carrying two barbells, you know, or dumbbells, you know, weights. It's it's not diff- it's not an easy thing to do, and yet Talha did this in a time of war. It's also a very very difficult time because you have arrows like bullets whizzing by you all the time. So imagine when you're in such a vulnerable position where you're not hiding, you're not running, you're not hiding, you're 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 just you're just lifting the prophet. You could have been hit at any time. So he took great 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 threat to himself, obviously for the Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and um, so he did that to encourage him. And he did that to also, uh, you know, give give a type of a strength to him, and to put uh, happiness into the heart of anyone who was who was sad. Because the Prophet got up, because everyone had lost hope of the battle. They said, "Oh, Prophet comes dead. Why? Are, then if he's gone, then why are we alive? You know, why shouldn't we be dead too?" Subhanallah. So, so the Prophet Sallallahu when he went up there, he brought happiness to the hearts of everybody. They all came back, right, and. Um, uh, yeah, and so this was actually a way of 
repaying Talha as well for the fact that he sacrificed himself uh, on that day for the Prophet ﷺ because it is said that he got 80, 80 something hits on his back and all around his body protecting the Prophet ﷺ. And his hand was actually made paralyzed because of how he, because he was protecting the Prophet ﷺ from his back. And in the years later, he would be, he would, he was taking off his shirt, like, you know, when you're changing, and all of a sudden they saw all these nasty scars on his back, crisscrossing his back. They're like, whoa, what is that? All these scars all over his back. He said, that was the day I was protecting Rasulullah Sassan. That was from that time. Decades later, people used to look at back, his back and his, his hand was paralyzed, subhanAllah. So this is why he gets that, that, that Jannah, subhanAllah, when you make that um, sacrifice for Rasulullah. Hadathana Ahmed ibn Abi Amr, Hadathana Sufyan ibn Uyayna, An Yazid ibn Khusayfa, An Issaib ibn Yazid, Anna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kana alayhi yawm uhudin dir'an qad zahara baynahuma. That the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore on the day of Uhud two coats of mail between which he rendered support. Meaning he wore one chain mail and then maybe he put like a cloth between the two and then put another one, right? So th- this is talking about the description of how he wore. Now, why did he wear two chain mails? Number one, because war at the time, you know, this is your concern. You have to think strategically. One chain mail might not be enough to stop an arrow. Maybe two will be better. So he also is showing, the Prophet is showing that it is while you have tawakkul in Allah, you also take the means to protect yourself. So you don't say, I'm not going to lock my doors because I have trust in Allah in the night. You know, if you're too lazy to do it, that's a different story. But, you know, you don't do that. You say, no, I'm going to lock the door in my car, in my whatever, and I'm going to put my trust in Allah. He's showing us that just because you're wearing armor, you know, doesn't mean that you don't trust Allah, you know. And so, subhanAllah, uh, he never, the Prophet never went out to battle without armor, just going like this, open, you know. And that's why the Prophet said, tie your camel first and then trust in Allah. You know, it's a very big lesson for us that he didn't go out with one, two. So do we take the best means? A lot of times Muslims, um, you know, sometimes it's like, okay, it's understandable if you don't have the means for to do something. Um, but, you know, they, they have this idea sometimes of like, we're so religious that, you know, we're going to do without. And the Prophet was not like this. He was the type of person, he would you know, prepare every single thing to do the best job possible, right? Um, the other thing is that he had put something in between them. And perhaps that was uh, in order to protect one piece of armor against the other, right? So uh, some sort of layer, uh, perhaps. Uh, yeah. And this is this hadith is also an example of a mursal hadith between Sahaba. What does mursal hadith mean? The Sahaba who narrated this event was not narrating directly. Uh, He was not the one who witnessed the event. Why? Because Asaib did not witness the day of Uhud. So what it means is that there's someone between the Sahabi and and the event that is narrating. Now usually a Mursal Hadith in which there's a narrator that is dropped could be considered weak by the hadith scholars right because you have a link that's missing who told you right it's like if one of us said you know i i don't know um oh at the i don't know at the independence of india and pakistan this happened so obviously none of us were alive at that time so we didn't see it so that means we heard it from someone who saw it and they told us now in the case where a sahabi narrates but it's a mursal of a sahabi all of the sahaba are trustworthy they never ever, there's no proof that any Sahaba ever lied in Hadith, alhamdulillah. And so we believe that he must have taken from another Sahabi and therefore we don't consider it broken. It's a mursal, but it's still strong because a Sahaba can 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 narrate from another Sahaba and without any problem. Now the next chapter is Babu ma ja'a fi sifati mighfari Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa the That which has come in the description of the helmet of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And uh, as you know, what is a helmet exactly, right? Let's see here. Sorry, this thing is giving a little bit of trouble. Yeah. Okay, so if you see, uh, what is a helmet? What is a helmet? It's basically like, uh, a, obviously it's like a cap that you wear made of iron. 
and it is fashioned to the shape of your head. So it protects your head from blows to the head. And it is it is worn underneath your cap. So what they would do is they would wear the metal first, the metal uh, cap, basically, and then they would wear a hat on top of it. And uh, it is actually considered from among the weapons, even though it's an armor, you consider it from the weapons, right? So weapon, weapon could mean what you fight with and what you defend with as well. That's why it's called a silah or a weapon. There are two hadiths in this regard. The first one is Hadathan Qutayb ibn Sa'id, Hadathan Malik ibn Anas, and Ibn Shihab, and Ibn Shihab, and Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, dakhala makata wa alayhi mirfar. Faqila lahu, hadha ibn Khatal, mutaalikun mi astal al Kaaba, faqal uqtuluhu. Sorry, this thing is losing battery. That Anas radiallahu anhu narrates, whoops. Anas reported that the Prophet ﷺ, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, entered into Mecca in the year of liberation, during the conquest of Mecca, in the ninth year of Hijrah. And he had a helmet on his head. When he took it off, a man came and told him, Ibn Khatal is clinging to the curtains of the Kaaba. So the Prophet said, execute him. And Ibn Shihab said, it has also reached me that the Messenger of Allah, peace be and blessings be upon him, was not in a state of ritual sanctity on that day. Okay, so uh, this is another hadith. We'll read Hadathan Isa ibn Ahmad, Hadathan Abdullah ibn Wahab, Hadathan Malik ibn Anas, an ibn Shihab, an Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dakhala Mecca ta'am al Fatih, wa ala rasihi al Mirfar, kala falamma naza'ahu ja'ahu rajulun, fakala lahu ibn Khatul al Musta Mutalikun bi asal kaaba, fakal uktuluhu, kal ibn Shihab, balagani, Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lam yakun yawm idin muhriman. Now, what do we learn from this? First of all, what's the story? Now, the Prophet came into Mecca wearing a helmet. And uh, this does not contradict the next narration that's going to come, in which he came in wearing a turban. Well, did he wear a helmet or did he wear a turban? Which one was it? Because they say wearing a, t a helmet does not prevent you from tying a turban on top of it. right? So they would have a helmet and then wear a turban on top of that. right? In order to protect the 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 head, you know, and uh, or what they would also do, then you could even wear a turban underneath the helmet, although that might be a little bit more difficult to protect your your head from touching the metal right uh, directly, right? And uh, it also shows again the Prophet ﷺ when he came into Mecca, he was ready for war, he was not he was ready for fighting, he was not coming in in, in ihram. And we know the laws of Mecca is that when you enter Mecca, you must enter in ihram if you're just coming in like that. But this was an exception that Allah made on that day, on that hour, just for Rasulullah. Because normally Mecca is haram. You cannot walk in and violate Mecca. You, don't, you can't come and fight there. But Allah lifted that for the Prophet to come back in. And alhamdulillah, there was, very, there was little to no fighting anyways, but he was dressed ready. And that was the impression that the people also needed to see that he was serious. And then he forgave everyone, right? So Alhamdulillah. So he did not come in with ihram. Now, if it is said, um, you, know, uh, you know, that the Prophet ﷺ said, it is not permissible for any of you to carry their weapons in Mecca, you know, they say, well, there's no, it's not a contradiction because this was for a need. And it was made, it was made halal for him for, for an hour of the day that you can enter with your weapons, not in ihram, and it was not permissible for anyone before nor anyone after to come in carrying weapons like that to fight because that is makru, that is uh, disliked. <clears throat> now, who is uh, Ibn uh, Khattal? He was a person, Ibn Khattal. So the Prophet comes in and there's a man hanging from the curtains of the Kaaba begging for mercy. The Prophet said to have him executed. Why? He was a man who had become Muslim then he apostated, and then he killed another Muslim who was his servant. And he was also someone who uh, was, would attack the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims. And he, uh, he had actually employed two slave girls to sing to send attacks on the Prophet ﷺ. And so this is why, uh, given that he killed someone and that he was a, someone who 
uh, made propaganda against the Muslims in order to harm them in warfare and in order to do a psychological operation against them. This is why the Prophet ﷺ said that this is a war criminal. And a war criminal would, would be executed, does not treat it like all of the other uh, Meccans who are forgiven. He was, um, uh, uh, that was an exception to him. And in Jahiliya, the, the habit was anybody who wanted to have protection, like they're going to be killed or something, they would hang on to the curtains of the Kaaba, whatever crime they did, and once they hang on, then okay, then you can't touch him. No, but in this case, it wasn't like that. If you're a war criminal and you killed somebody, you will get be brought to justice, even if you're hanging from the curtains of the Kaaba, right? So Ammar ibn Yasser and others uh, went forward to 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 do that, right? And this was actually very in when in it was almost a bloodless entry. Almost all the people of Mecca were forgiven, except a few people who had done some very very wrong things. They were still taken to justice because you know there's justice that has to be served as well. But the personal persecution from the Meccans, the Prophet forgave that. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? And um, so it was an exception. Otherwise, everyone else was told that whoever enters into the masjid or the house of Abu Sufyan or their own house is protected, right? Uh, and the next thing, this is why the Malikis actually said uh, that, uh, you know, then they talk about other issues that, uh, you know, other legal issues that we won't get into. Um, but one thing uh, might be said as well. However, this does not give permission uh, for anybody to just go do a vigilante action if someone insults the Prophet ﷺ. You can't just go and just do what you want, you know. This is the Prophet ﷺ himself saying, you know. Now, fiqh-wise, there's a discussion Imam Bajuri has, just out of total academic honesty, around this issue. But we have to understand when reading these classical issues, how that affects our modern situation and how that applies in the modern world with laws, with covenants, with agreements, with social contracts. And so uh, Muslims have to realize that you're in a, that situation now is controlled by when you're in a government situation, you can't just go and do a vigilante action because someone insulted the Prophet ﷺ. None of my teachers or the scholars that I know have, uh, have uh, approved or permitted something like that. Alhamdulillah. So it's something to watch out for. That when you read classical texts, you cannot just draw your own conclusions from sirah and hadith. This is a big, big cause of extremism in our world today, right? Even when you're reading something that's, that's written in the 1800s, the ulama have to be the ones who interpret how do you act on this or how do you act on this in our time, right? The, the, they did, Sahaba didn't just go and do that action. The Prophet ﷺ, as a judge and as the ruler, he made a certain decision about a war criminal, right? Uh, so the, the next section is, Babu fi sifati amamati Rasulillahi sallallahu And here's, a, by the way, a picture before we get into that. Uh, about some of the swords that they are, are, are attributed to the Prophet right? Some of the swords that they have. And this is a, another thing I just thought to share. This is not the, the style that the Sahaba had, but the helmets here, it gives you uh, an historical idea of uh, different Muslim dynasties you know, the, for during the Mamluk times, during Muslim Spain, during, uh, uh, you know, what are Saracens? Or, you know, those are the Western uh, Orientalist terms for the Muslim Moorish and Saracen. And, but it gives you an idea what it means to have a helmet and then a turban on top of it. And that was what I was trying to say. Uh, for more details, just watch the Turkish, what's that, Ertegru? Er they, ha they have nice turbans. So the turban of the Prophet ﷺ, that which has come about the turban of the Prophet ﷺ. So the first thing is, let's see if we have this here. Yeah. So the first thing is, what is the, the, the turban itself? A turban is something that you wrap around the head. Um, and what it means here is not, it's not always having to come with a helmet or something like that. The imama, as it's called in Arabic, is a sunnah, uh, especially in prayer, to wear the turban, right? And it is also good to wear for the in, uh, intention of tajammul, to beautify oneself. You know, when someone wraps a really nice turban, how, how beautiful that looks, right? Alhamdulillah. And so this is something that is very good. And there are many, many reports about it. So the sunnah, you achieve it if you uh, just tie a, a cloth around your head or around a cap like this, for example. Either way, you can have that. That's considered wrapping a turban. Now, there is a, there is a report, a prophetic report, that the difference between us and between the disbelievers are our turbans on top of caps, the qalansuwa. 
right? So there is a report about that, right? However, uh, you know, subhanAllah, interestingly, Imam Bajuri says this idea of just wearing a hat alone without a turban is actually from the dress of the mushrikeen. So he says that just wearing a cap alone, no. The Muslims always tied turbans around their heads, right? On top of a cap, right? Or without. So, um, but obviously times change, times pass, different customs and cultures come. Now, now non-Muslims don't wear caps and we wear caps, you know, but back then everyone was wearing a cap. Pretty much the only other people who wear caps um, the Jewish people wear a kippah, a very small one over here. But generally, you see a kufi on somebody, you, you know that the person is a Muslim. Strange thing is, we've also stopped wearing turbans. And now when you see t- your turban, you think Sikh. SubhanAllah. And where is our sunnah? Where is the sunnah of the Prophet? SubhanAllah. <sighs> May Allah you know, bring us back to all the beautiful sunnahs of the Prophet. You know. uh, it's not far, but it is sunnah. So the other thing is, it shows that uh, and in the hadith it, there is uh, indications that you should tie a turban that is big right uh, but it's a very weak hadith to, to, to show that right so you wouldn't act on that it's too weak to act, to act on however Ibn al-Qayyim said the imama of the Prophet ﷺ was not so big that it's so heavy on the head and it's like it's you know so some cultures have these huge turbans Especially if you look at these like old paintings of, you know, like big, big turbans, right? And and that's not that's not the sunnah. Neither that it's so small that it cannot protect the head. Because what did they wear turbans for? They wore turbans to protect themselves from heat and cold. So before you had a winter cap, winter hat, you could just tie a turban, even covering your ears, and it would protect your head. In the heat, instead of your the sun burning down on you, you had a turban, and it would provide even a type of a visor and around the ears, around the back. So how it's coming out, it protects uh, it protects the head, right? But rather the Prophet's turban was medium between all of those things. And it is also said, uh, there is nothing, uh, Ibn Hajj al-Haytami said, uh, that there is nothing actually related about the length and the width of the Prophet's turban. And Allah knows best, right? However, uh, there are, you know, some some reports that said it was seven arm lengths, you know, and other than that, and one arm length wide, but there is no uh, basis for that. Uh, in fact, uh, Mullah Ali al-Qari has a treatise on the, the turban, so you can actually, uh, if anybody's interested, they can go read that. However, Imam, uh, Imam al-Nawawi said that the Prophet Sallallahu imama was actually uh, was short and it was about six uh, arm lengths and uh, he also had a longer imama so a shorter one and a one shorter one of six arm lengths uh, which would be about how much is that like about two feet or something and then a no- longer one that was 12 so he had two and and the shafi's so there was difference of opinion how should you tie your imama and some of the, the Malikis, what they say is you tie the imama and then you go underneath your chin and you tie it like that. So you're tying it around and you pass it underneath your chin. That's called tahnik. Tahnik is because the hanak, it's, it's, you're basically, you're putting it around the lower area. However, the Shafi's say this is not a sunnah. So there's a difference of opinion. Should you tie your turban like this around or underneath your chin um, as well? Uh, some of them said, however, some of the uh, hadith scholars said this is the sunnah, right? And p- they differed of, in opinion. So there are five hadiths in this chapter, inshallah. Let's read the first one. Qala hadathana Muhammad ibn Bashar, hadathana Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, an Hamad ibn Salama, ha, wa hadathana Mahmud ibn Ghailan, hadathana Waqi'ah, an Hamad ibn Salama, an Abi Zubair, an Jabir, qala, dakhala Nabiu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Makkata yawm al-Fathi, wa alayhi amamatun sauda. A very famous hadith. Jabir said that the Prophet ﷺ entered uh, Mecca on the Day of Liberation wearing a black turban. Now what do we learn about this black turban? Now, the commentators say, a commentator said uh, that it was not actually 
black, like the black, the, the color black of my 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 vest. Rather, uh, it's black. Rather, one of the commentators said it was the uh, helmet underneath that was black. That's one opinion. Or that the turban itself was so, uh, it was affected by dirt and all of these things because you're traveling, you know, you're, you're whatever, and you don't have like, you know, bleach or something to, to dye your clothing. So it gets so dark that when they, when they saw that, they considered that black, right? And this is what some of people have said as well, because other people describe the turban not as soda, but as dasma, as like oily, uh, almost like uh, when you see a white cloth and it gets very oily and stuff, it has like brown streaks, starts to become dark like that. And uh, this is actually a big difference of opinion. Was it like literally black or was it black, meaning it was it had just ca- gotten kind of dirtyish or or dusty and then because of that, right? Um, so, um now, in this section, in this hadith, it also talks about, uh, you know, so the fact that you have black over the color white in this, uh, in this situation, right? What is that reason for that situation? They go on to talk about um, a linguistic thing as well. Now, some people said that the imam of the Prophet Wasallam that he wore on the day of the uh, Fatah of Mecca was given to his uncle Abbas and then it was passed down in his family until the Abbasid Caliphate. So the Abbasids, they overthrew the Umayyad dynasty and they were descendants of Abbas. So some say that this same imama was passed down to them and they had it, right? And they used to tie it on the person's head when they, they became Khalifa, right? And, uh, you know, you know, Allahu Alam, some people said this. Now, the other thing is this. Just the fact that the Prophet wore a black turban and that the angels came down in different colors of turbans on the day of Badr does not mean that white is still... it. it white is not the best color. The Prophet said, actually, white, prefer white in your clothing, you know, especially on Fridays and, the, and these days when Muslims get together. Uh, it doesn't necessarily <clears throat> go against that. In the next hadith, Hadith Ibn Abi Umar, Hadith Sufyan, and Musawir al Warraq, and Jafar Ibn Amr Ibn Huray Ibn Hurayth, and Abihi Qal. Right to Allah Rasi Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Imamatan Soda. So another hadith very similar that I saw on the head of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a black turban. حدثنا محمود قال حدثنا محمود بن غيلان ويوسف بن عيسى قال حدثنا وكيع عن مساور الوراق عن جعفر بن عمر بن حريث عن أبيه أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خطب الناس وعليه عمامة سوداء uh, Also narrated that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم gave a khutbah to people and he was wearing a black turban right It's also described the turban has also described as harqaniya uh, that what that whose tail was hanging between the shoulder blades. Harqaniya means it is the color of something that is burnt with fire, right? So that that maybe not literally black, but like a dark, a very dark color as well. So the the Arabs at the time sometimes they would call different colors, like they would generalize a different color. So even sometimes if something was very green, they would call it black. I don't know how. Sometimes it's very very dark green, they would call it black. So. Um, black did not necessarily mean like the pitch black that we are talking about, and Allah knows best. Hadith Qala Hadithna Harun ibn Ishaq al Hamdani, Hadithna Yahya ibn Muhammad al Madini. Oh, by the way, it's also mentioned uh, that it also shows that it is permissible to wear black while giving the khutbah, even if white is better. So some people might think, you know, that oh you can't wear black while giving the khutbah because you have to wear white it's not the case uh, you know culturally people will take something that is mustahab and make it like you have to so subhanallah i even heard uh, recently of a mufti a big scholar he he went to give khutbah in one of the masjids and he was a guest and excuse me he was like a guest of honor coming to give khutbah and some people said oh no you're not dressed exactly how our imams should dress they pulled him off the member they said no you can't give the khutbah 
so people get this idea that when culture when they don't seek knowledge and culture becomes uh, their religion <clears throat> then what happens is even something that is mustahab becomes like fard and for example there may be times where wearing black is not the appropriate thing so for example I remember I came to a gathering in Jordan <coughs> and I wore a big black turban I was new I wore a big black turban huge and my sheikh uh, when we went to go he came and whispered in my ear uh, try a different color you know now well, turban is black turban is sunnah but that's when the Prophet ﷺ wore this to enter Mecca in a time of war. To come to the gatherings of dhikr and knowledge uh, may not be that appropriate color in that Islamic cultural setting. Or there may be another sect of Muslims who wear black on a certain, on a certain day, certain times to represent their own beliefs. So when you wear a black turban, everything's, oh, are you so and so? Are you from this group? Are you from that group? It's like, no, no, no. So this is why sometimes. When you're in a place where it will be confused, even if it's a sunnah, you can part with it only because it will associate not with sunnah, but with associating with a group that has deviant beliefs or different beliefs, right? So, alhamdulillah. And, um, <clears throat> so where do we start the hadith? We'll go for a little bit more. قال حدثنا حرور بن إسحاق الحمداني حدثنا يحيى بن محمد المديني عن عبد العزيز بن محمد عن عبيد الله بن عمر النافع عن ابن عمر قال كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا تم سدل عمامته بين كتفيه. That Ibn Umar said when the Prophet ﷺ wore a turban, he used to let the end of his turban hang down between his shoulders. Now, let's see what Imam Bajuri has to say. So that means when he wrapped his turban around, he allowed the the end that was uh, that that. Yeah. So this is a good question. This is a good question. There are two ends of a turban, right? Because a turban is a long cloth. Is it that the first end of the turban is hanging between the shoulders and then he wraps the rest around? Or is it that he wrapped the turban around and then then let the end of that go? So that's that's the that's one question. But the point is that he wrapped it around and one of them was there. Was it the high was it the higher one? You know, uh, is it the lower one? And these are called tur- uh, tails or it's also called like a braid or like a tail. It could be the, the lower uh, end of the turban or the higher one. Or it could also be both tails of the turban. So have you seen people wearing two tails in their turban? So you have you have one tail and then you have you wrap it around and then you, the excess, you don't want to make your turban big, so you push it through and you bring both down. So they have two tails in a turban coming down. This is also very possible and it's all fine, right? So also the Prophet ﷺ, did not always let the tail of his turban hang down. Because there's a riwayah in Sahih Muslim that the Prophet entered Mecca and he had a black turban and they did not mention anything hanging down. So it's possible. Uh, and even Al-Qayyim actually said clearly that that means that he, that thing was hanging down. So he just wrapped the whole thing around his head. Like how now how you see a Sikh turban, there's no tail coming down. That's what they mean, right? Um, obviously the style was different. Now, uh, now this could possibly be because the Prophet was getting ready for battle and you don't want to have a loose end that someone can grab onto so he wrapped the entire thing around his head. Right. So every single time he would dress according to what that place demanded. This is also very important. If the Prophet dressed like a place, like something in a time of war, it doesn't mean that that is a sunnah now to go to school. You know, So he dressed according to his occasion. And we should also, as Muslims, learn to dress according to our occasion, just as a, a prophetic, you know, a prophetic example. So you might go to a wedding. You don't necessarily have to go to a wedding wearing, you know, what you wear on a daily basis, saying, oh, this is a sunnah, I'm just going to wear it to a wedding. You know, you might have different things on Eid, for example, and your culture might differ. So the tail of the turban is a sunnah. And what is the hikmah of the sunnah? If you go down to the, if you look at the last uh, highlight there, what the, the hikmah of the sunnah is that it makes something look beautiful when you have a tail there, right? And b- putting it between the shoulder blades is better than putting it over your shoulder on the front. Um, and uh, because it frees up the hands. When you have a turban tail coming into the front, every time you're moving around, it's like kind of like moving around and it's kind of coming in the way, right? And so this is why they you put it to the back. It's the same kind of similar reason why a lady with long hair, you may have a braid coming in the front, but you just put it in the back, for example, tie your hair up in the back so it doesn't uh, interfere with what's happening 
uh, with your arms and stuff like that. <clears throat> the other thing is, um, uh, now, uh, it is also possible that you can put it in front of you. He's saying like the Sufis do. They put it in front of you. That's what he says. And some of the people of knowledge also put it in front. Right? Now the question came, is it better to put it on the right side, the tail of the turban coming the right side, or on the left side? Right? So this is also a, um, a difference of opinion. Let me get down to that. <coughs> And uh, there is also an, uh, a narration in Tabarani that shows that maybe the right side would be better, but it is weak. And the Sufis, he says, they thought it was better to leave it on the left side because it is covering the heart, right? So uh, it reminds you when it's touching the heart that you should free your heart of anything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's like a, not from the Sunnah, but that's a spiritual interpretation from the spiritual masters, also called the Sufis. And... Some of the Shafi's said, uh, if you feel that uh, leaving a turban tail is going to cause uh, you know, pride, then you should not do it. Right, let me see him. Ah, sorry, the, some of the Shafi's said, even if you think that having a tail of the turban is going to cause pride, you should still do it and battle your nafs because something's from the sunnah then, then, then you don't think that it's some from pride that's what they're saying and the other thing is that the, the minimum length that has been narrated has been four arm lengths of a turban so it's not very very short uh, and it's uh, you know and also that the width akthar ma warada fihi dira'a shibr and an and arms uh, hand span uh, I guess that's the width you know, and Allah knows best. But they also say you should not have such a big turban that it becomes ostentatious. You know, like you know, like a turban tail like coming down, it's like a train a bridal train and you're wrapping it around your arms like a like you know it's like a royal turban. That's not something that is from the Sunnah of the Prophet. <coughs> <coughs> um قال نافع وكان ابن عمر يفعل ذلك ابن عمر يستدعى ذلك well. قال عبيد الله ورأيت القاسم ابن محمد وسالم يفعلان ذلك and قاسم ابن محمد and سالم also used to do that قال حدثنا يوسف ابن عيسى حدثنا وكيع حدثنا أبو سليمان وهو عبد الرحمن ابن الغسيل عن كرمة عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنه عنهما أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم خطب الناس وعليه أمامة دسماء this is the different narration where he's saying Ibn Abbas said the Prophet ﷺ addressed the people in a khutbah while wearing a turban that was marked with traces of oil from his hair, right? That's why they called it dasma. Now, what does it mean when something is dasma? So this is actually when the Prophet ﷺ, uh, was in his uh, sickness that he passed away in. So he was treating his hair with a lot of oil at the time, perhaps, and his turban had become stained with that oil. Uh, that was during his illness when he came out to give a khutbah to the Ansar. <clears throat> and he had this, this turban uh, because Ibn Abbas was, was a young boy, so that's probably what he remembered. What does it mean? It means it is stained or mixed with oil because the Prophet ﷺ would put a lot of oil in his hair, and so that would also uh, come into the turban. The next section is that which has come regarding the description of the izar, the lungi, or the sarong, or the waist strap, of the Prophet ﷺ, what you wear around the waist, right? And um, <clears throat> first of all, what is the izar? <laughs> it is the opposite to the rida. The rida is like a cloak that you wear on top and in hajj, right, for example, and a izar is what you wrap around your uh, the bottom of your of your aura to cover your aura. And they said that the length of the izar of the Prophet ﷺ was four uh, cubits, four, cub four, uh, four arm lengths. So that means it's very long. But how do you wrap it? You wrap it around, then you can turn it up like this. In some cultures, they, today they still have it. You know, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, um, um, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, it's, and Yemen as well, they still wear the, uh, the waist wrap. And you would wrap it around and then raise it up like this to however long that you want, right? Uh, and uh, let's see. Imam al-Bajuri says, the length was four, uh, and the width of it was two and a half uh, arm length okay so meaning it's not very very wide but you would wrap it and then turn it to secure it 
Uh, and it is also said that it was six arm lengths and three, three, six arm lengths long and three wide. Of course, don't forget that you can actually, uh, now what they do is they take it and they stitch it into a tube. So it's stitched now and you can come and just wrap it very easily, right? So um, in this hadith, let's see. Yeah. So the first hadith goes like this. قال حدثنا أحمد بن منيع حدثنا إسماعيل بن إبراهيم حدثنا أيوب عن حميد بن هلال عن أبي أبي بردة عن أبيه قال أخرجت إلينا عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها كساء ملبدا وإزارا غليظا فقالت قبض روح رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم في هذين الله أكبر عائشة may Allah be pleased with her brought out to us a patched and frayed sheet and a coarse waistcloth then she said the soul of the Messenger of Allah was taken while he was wearing these two things. Allahu Akbar. Just imagine how she kept that exactly the way it was because that was so important. Allahu Akbar. And SubhanAllah. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she used to keep the things of the Prophet Wasallam, Right? Why? To get tabarruk from them. Obviously for love as well. Right? And she used to have his, uh, she used to have as well uh, a, a cloak that the Prophet Sallallahu used to wear A jubba tayalasi A cloak That you cloak over perhaps And uh, and when she passed away Then her sister Asma She took it And uh, she used to take it To seek a cure for sick people So what she would do when someone was sick She would bring out the jubba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And she would Dip it in a bucket of water and then take it away, and then the person who would drink from the water or make wudu from the water, and alhamdulillah, seek a cure from that. Allahu Akbar. And Asma herself mentioned that she used to do that. Now this cloth, the Prophet was taken in, <coughs> was mulabbadan, meaning it was worn out completely. And it was, uh, you know, what covered the top. Mulabbad also means patched up. Right, so there's like people would put patches. Nowadays, subhanAllah, we don't put patches in our clothes anymore. Remember we used to do that? Like when you're, you know, you might have a rip in your jeans and you even have like these iron-on patches back in the day, you know, and that you could take it to the tailor or forget your tailor, your mom would just say, oh, okay, I'll just patch it for you. Where are those days gone? SubhanAllah. Now it's like you just, like the color of your jeans starts to fade. Give it away. Get a new one. This is the reality of our time. So I don't know, perhaps maybe be good one day to try to patch one of our clothing and wear it patched, you know. Um, so people say, oh, okay, why are you wearing a patch? Why don't you just get a new one? It's so cheap, you know. But you're just doing it to remember the Prophet would repair his own clothing, you know, subhanAllah. And he, his izar was very, very rough. So not, not a, he, he didn't pass away wearing luxurious clothing. He passed away in very simple clothing, subhanAllah. And uh, Allahu Akbar. So his, 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 his life was passed, as Aisha is trying to say, between a frayed garment, simplicity and roughness. A frayed top and a rough bottom. Between simplicity and roughness is how the Prophet ﷺ exited the world. He did not want, even though he had nice clothes, but he did not want the charms of the dunya. He didn't want that. He wanted the, the akhirah, subhanAllah. You know. And this is even after Islam was very victorious and they had power and everything, yet he still did that. So what do you get from this? <clears throat> it actually, you learn from this hadith that you should try to make the last part of your life a place where you are letting go of uh, adornment. As you get older, when you're young, you want to dress fashionably, dress nice, you know. But as you get older, it's, it's a sunnah, according to this, to start dressing simply, start letting go of the dunya, don't like how you be in fashion right until the end. You know, act as though you 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 you're gonna go to another place, you know, a better place, you know. And the Sufiya, actually, they take from this as well to wear wool because wool, Suf, is why they're called Sufiya actually, or part of the reason why, because they used to wear very coarse clothing, wool, because um, you know, it is it is it reminds you that this is not a place to have luxury necessarily, right? Um, Subhanallah, and and Subhanallah, that some of them actually started to take the wearing the wool as a sign of pride. And so, subhanAllah, can you believe, he's, uh, Imam Bajuri says, so those people who started to take simple clothing as a sign of piety and as a sign of now pride, 
you violated the very spiritual path that you took to wear that, you violated that. You know? So sometimes it's not just about, you know, dressing simply can become an act of pride. I'm not talking what you doubt inside your heart. Oh, I don't know, is it pride or not? What it means is it's just become like a uniform now. And there's no longer the idea of dressing simply. In fact, subhanAllah, uh, I've noticed this as well. In our times, some of the ulama, some very humble, humble ulama, you know, you see them walking around in like normal pants, half sleeve shirt, you know, as a normal clothing, as a sign of humility, because they don't want to dress like in the big clothing and stuff like that. So they dress very, very humble and very simply. How? By dressing according to the people, how you guys are dressed right now. They dress like that, you know. So it really depends on that person's own state. Sometimes, sometimes people may feel like dressing like religiously, quote unquote, like this, you know, uh, helps them. Others say dressing in a, in a fashion of the culture around them, that helps them more. So you can't actually judge when you're looking at somebody how religious they are by their clothing. This is the point. It's really according to the individual what they want to do. Some people cover their heads and they feel, you know, with a cap or something, they feel this is how I want to do it. Some people don't do it. You can't say, oh, this person is religious, not, not religious. You can't do that. Everyone follows the sunnah according to their own um, intentions and their feelings, right? And it's also the other thing. Uh, let's see, is there any other lessons from that? No. Okay, we'll read a few more minutes, inshallah. قال حدثنا محمود بن غيلان حدثنا أبو أبو داود عن شعبة عن الأشعث بن سليم قال سمعت أمتي تحدث عن أمها قال بين أنا أمشي بالمدينة إذا إنسان خلفي يقول ارفع إزارك فإنه أتقى وأبقى فإذا هو رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقلت يا رسول الله إنما هي بردة ملحاء قال أما لك في أسوة فنظرت فإذا إزاره إلى نصف ساقيه الله أكبر الأشعث بن سليم said I heard my maternal aunt relate on the authority of her paternal uncle, subhanAllah, said, while I was walking in Medina, someone behind me said, raise up your waist cloth, for that is more pious and more conducive to wearing it longer. And lo and behold, he turned around and it was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So I said, oh Rasulullah, it's just a simple black garment with white stripes. Like, this is a cheap garment. Like if it gets drags on the ground and gets dirty, I don't, it doesn't matter, right? It's a cheap garment. And he said, don't you have an example in me? And he said, then I looked at Rasulullah and his waist cloth was also to the halfway of his chins. Look how the be beautiful example, right? Like, just imagine you're walking in Medina and you hear a voice behind you to fix something. And you turn around, it's Rasulullah. This is how he cared about people. He wouldn't, you know, he would tell them, hey, do this, do that. And he's saying that this was the sign because in those days, dragging your clothes on the ground was a sign of pride. It's to tell other people, look how rich I am. You have one piece of cloth, I have ten. You know, I don't care if it gets dirty. I don't care. Um, even up to now, you know, if you buy a really expensive pair of designer jeans and you wear them so long that they're coming under your shoes and they're getting all ripped up and you just do it because you don't care if your jeans get ripped. You just buy a new pair of designer jeans. That's pride, right? You don't do that. So the Prophet ﷺ, when the person complained that, well, it's just a cheap cloth. Like, don't worry about it, Rasulullah. He said, don't you have an example in me? Because Allah SWT says, لَقَدَ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ That there is indeed for you in the Messenger of Allah a beautiful example to take from. And this is how he would tell people. He wouldn't argue back. He would just say, look at me. And then the, then the Sahabi said, okay, خلاص, that's enough that I need to tell myself that I have to do this. Right? So, um, yeah. So the Prophet ﷺ is telling people, without telling them, just look at me and follow my example. Now, putting your clothes to half of your shins, Imam Nawawi says, this is the mustahab way to do it, right? The mustahab length. However, uh, you know, it is ja'iz without any dislike, you know, wait a second. Yeah. What is between the Nis, uh, the half of your calves right up to your ankles then this is permissible without any dislike and whatever is beneath uh, for men of course this is for not for ladies whatever is beneath the ankles out of pride is haram and whatever is not out of pride but still below the ankles is makru and uh, according to the Hanafi school if it's not out of pride that's makru tanzihan so sometimes you know you, like you buy a pair of khakis or jeans or something, 
uh, and it's just kind of coming below. It's not dragging on the ground, but it's just like covering the ankle a little bit, or coming up, coming up to the to top of the foot. Uh, this is makrut and zihan, but there are also reasons where a person may do this that may make it more permissible. For example, so you don't want to have a big gap between your shoes and your your um, your pants, for example, in snow, so nothing gets inside it, for example. Or it just becomes the custom and the culture of the place that you're living in that, you know, not to drag it, but just to wear it a little longer. So these are things that if you can follow the sunnah and, you know, not, dra- uh, not wear it below, even if it's not out of pride, it's a good thing to do. If you don't do it, it's not sinful or haram, but it's makrut and zihan, slightly uh, disliked. And what I noticed is the, what I noticed from, there are different opinions. The indo pak scholars generally take this very, very strictly. Even, even beyond like the Hanafi school, they go st- kind of straight to the hadiths and would consider anything uh, below the ankle to be absolutely forbidden. Um, so th- that's not on the letter of the Hanafi school according to how we learned it with the Arab scholars. They're de- generally saying it's good. You shouldn't do it below your ankles. But if it is a slightly, you don't like condemn people for it or say, hey, you know, you can't be the imam or something like that. Like, you know, although, you know. And then there are other people as well who started to take uh, shortening their clothing up to the middle of ankle uh, of the calves. They started to take that. And some of the ulama in the Arab world, they say that it's almost become like a sign of ostentatious piety. Because it's so different from your society that even among religious Muslims, like, okay, the ulama are not wearing, you're rarely going to see a, a scholar wearing uh, clothes up to half of the shins. You don't see that usually. It's quite high if you think about it. Um, so even though they're well aware of the sunnah and what's mustahab, you don't see them doing that. But you see sometimes some very young, zealous uh, people who are like, they do that. And so a lot, some of the ulama of the Arab world actually said that this becomes like religious ostentation because you don't have the knowledge and you don't have that, but you're emphasizing these sunnahs. And so this is something that if that's the way you're doing it, then, then other people should not do it because it's not being done out of a sense of knowledge. It's being done out of a sense of religious ostentation. So Allah knows best. There's, that, there's those differences of opinion, but you respect everyone in what they're doing for the sake of Allah SWT. Now, uh, they also say that just like how your pants or your izar, also your jubba should not hang down uh, lower, you know, for, for men. Now, for women, it is actually sunnah for them to drag their garment on the, on the ground, just about a hand span. And the most is about one arm's length. So that's a lot. So that means you could be walking and you have a little bit of the garment trailing. Why is that? Because uh, if you, uh, the reason why is because... You know, you need to do different things, do different work. If you were to, for example, get into a car, okay, you're wearing, a lady is wearing a skirt and she wants to step up onto a step. So then you don't want that the garment gets pulled and the, the above the foot is shown, or the ankle and above that, because that's a part of the aura, right? So this is why the Prophet said, let the, you know, he gave ijazah for them to drag a little bit, but not so much as well. Somebody sent me a question the other day. Uh, is it allowed to have a bridal train? You know, like in a bridal dress, and then like it's going so much that sometimes you have like people carrying it in, like a princess, like a royalty or something like that. Uh, so, the, judging based on this, no. So Muslims are, you know, people of balance. We're not saying you know you wear it so short like men. Neither so long that you entered and like you know a minute later your dress is still coming into the door, you know, or something like that. Alhamdulillah. Uh, the next hadith. Okay, this will uh, we'll stop, I'll stop after this one. Qala haddathana Suwayd ibn Nasr, haddathana Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, an Musa ibn Ubaidah, an Iyas ibn Salamata ibn al-Akwa. An abihi qal, kana Uthman ibn Affan, ya'tazilu ila ansafi saqayhi, wa qala hakadha kanat izaru sahibi, yani nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Uthman ibn Affan used to also wear his izar to the half of his calves, and he said, this was the izar of my companion, meaning the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? Uh, so let's see. And uh, we'll just finish off this section. Hadathan Qutayba, Hadathana Abu Al-Ahwas an Ibn Abi Ishaq an Muslim Ibn Ibn Nudhir or Nudhir an Hudayfata Ibn Yaman qala akhada Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
بعضلة ساقي أو أو ساقه فقال هذا موضع الإزار فإن أبيت فأسفل فإن أبيت فلا حق للإزار في الكعبين سبحان الله خذيفة ابن اليابان said the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم took hold of the calf the, the fleshy part of my calves of either my legs or his leg either he did it for himself or he did it to, to the, the sahabi and the Prophet said this is the where the waist cloth should come down and if you object if you don't want to do it then somewhere lower down and if you object reject that too then just know that the waist cloth has no right to touch your ankles right so the beautiful thing about this is that the Prophet taught somebody you know by actually touching them like here right down to here or right, right down to here and so this shows that this actually you know you, you think about it and you notice that he's narrating the hadith while remembering the touch of Rasulullah so this is part of how a teacher teaches as well actually this technique is called anchoring in psychology if you want to uh, you know establish something you teach some, something but like for example your child you're teaching them a value and you always do the same action like put your arm on their on their shoulder or hold their hand or do that this is called anchoring so it ties the memory to a sensation and it stays with you longer right so subhanallah this is prophetic practice and now they're discovering this in psychology subhanallah and uh, so they talked about um, now the prophet we know there's a hadith that whatever is below the ankles is in hellfire in bukhari and what what this shows is that you can drop drop it right down to the ankles, but not below. And it, this is also uh, Imam Bujuri says also. وَيُحْمَلْ مَا هُنَا عَلَى الْمُبَالَغَةِ It could also be said that this is an exaggeration. Um, in not literally, it's in the hellfire, but to show, do not put it below the ankles, because the Arabs used to do this as a sign of pride, right? Um, yeah. And yeah, similar to the saying that the shepherd should not bring his sheep too close to the king's land because he might fall into it. So that's why they said, so that, you know, you kind of give a little bit of a buffer so you keep your pants at your, or your izar at a certain area. So inshallah, so we'll stop with this. If there are any other questions, please let me know. Are there any comments from the, from the forum? Alhamdulillah. Some, just something about my grandma. May Allah bless your grandma. Alhamdulillah. And about Indonesia as well. MashaAllah. Welcome. Salam to everybody. Okay. Inshallah. Khair. Okay. If there aren't any other questions, then uh, we'll see you guys next week, inshallah, which should be, this is 11, right? So next week should be the last class for this term, inshallah. Look forward to it. Barakallah fikum. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa alaikum wa